Okay, good afternoon, and thank you everyone for joining the briefing on the City of Philadelphia's response to COVID-19. Today, all the speakers are joining the briefing virtually to adhere to social distancing guidelines. And we will begin our briefing with opening remarks from Mayor Jim Kenney. Mayor, you have the floor. Thanks, Mike, and good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Earlier today, I signed a series of bills, including some related to the pandemic and our response efforts. Most notably, I signed the fiscal year 21 budget, which is a stark reminder of the toll that the crisis has had on our finances and our ability to deliver city services. I again thank City Council for their partnership throughout the hardest budget process of our careers. Among the bills signed today was the Essential Workers Protection Act introduced by Councilmember Gim, which promotes public health by protecting workers from retaliation for speaking out about working conditions that violate mandatory state or city public health orders. As we begin to reopen our economy, it is critical that employers are, all, are taking all necessary precautions to keep their workers healthy in order to help reduce the spread of coronavirus in Philadelphia. And Philadelphia workers deserve the ability to report potential violations of public health orders without fear of retaliation. Another bill signed today, Bill Number 200-329, allocates $40.4 million in Federal CARES Act funding that will allow planning and development to address emergency COVID-19 housing and community development needs. As we continue to recover from the impact of COVID-19 and see more city services resume, I'm glad to share that effective Monday, July 6th, the Streets Department will resume collecting recycling every week along with the trash. So no, no more every other week. It'll be every week with your trash. Regular trash and recycling collections will continue on or as close to its normal schedule as possible. Residents should not set out their recycling materials next week week of June 29th, as we are still on the every other week collection schedule until July 6th. And finally, I want to recognize the Philly Counts team for their ongoing efforts to continue to raise awareness about the 2020 census, despite a global pandemic and conditions that have flipped their entire engagement plan on its head. Throughout the summer, Philly Counts will be focused on promoting census participation through their summer of census plan, which includes actions such as yard sign and door hanger distribution, phone banking, spreading the word using social media, promoting census completion at various points of service and digital census events. Philly Counts has also continued engaging hard to reach communities during the pandemic through phone banking. Each day, the Philly Counts team and its volunteers call thousands of households to make sure that they have what they need to stay safe and healthy and create census awareness. To date, they have made nearly 100, 140,000 calls the households in Philadelphia that have made a census participation plan with over 7,000 households. This work is essential as we continue to recover. The census will determine how much funding Philadelphia receives for critical services, including disaster relief for the next decade. So it's very, very important that we all are, we're all counted. Uh, so now I'll turn it over to Dr. Farley for his update. Doctor. Thank you very much. All right, okay, thank you very much, Mayor. Um, the news about the epidemic in Philadelphia is very much mixed. Uh, the first wave of the epidemic appears to be ending, uh, but at the same time, a second wave is beginning. So we all need to be concerned and to minimize our health risks in this new wave, everyone needs to take safety guidelines seriously, especially the wearing of masks. First, let me back up and give you some numbers. Uh, since this time yesterday, we've identified 143 new cases of the coronavirus infection in Philadelphia residents bringing us to a total of 25,693 since the beginning of the epidemic. Since this time yesterday, we have identified zero new deaths from the infection, the total being 1,579. Now our data on deaths comes in batches, uh, so I can't tell you that it's gonna to continue to be zero. The fact that we have zero for one day is a sign that it's slowing down and that's good news. The outbreak of the infection in the jail is clearly ending. We've had no symptomatic cases in inmates in the past six weeks and our outbreaks in nursing homes are also ending. 85% of the nursing homes in Philadelphia have had no cases of this infection in the past two weeks, and more than 60% have had no cases in more than four weeks. At the same time, the cases in the community are no longer decreasing. Cases in the last week have averaged more than 100 per day, which is an increase from where we're seeing before. Now we're doing more tests, uh, but that increased testing does not explain the increased case count because the percent positive is also increasing. It's now about five to 6%, up from less than 5% about 10 days ago. 
Now, uh, the increase may be occurring in a variety of populations, but we have noticed in particular a spike in cases among teenagers between the ages of 16 to 19 that appear to be from them attending social events. That's something which has been seen nationally as an increase in this infection in younger adults and teenagers. Now that's what's happening in Philadelphia. Elsewhere, the signs of this epidemic are far worse. In the United States as a whole, case counts are up more than 50% in the past 14 days, and they're increasing in nearly every state. They're hitting new highs in many states. In Florida and Texas now, there are more than 5,000 cases per day that are being diagnosed. And hospitals in Texas are already under strain from the number of infections uh, that are causing cases for them to treat, and that's likely to get worse. Now, case counts are rising in many regions of Pennsylvania and the state of Pennsylvania as a whole, and they're rising in Delaware, and they're rising in New Jersey. So in sum, nationally, we are seeing a very big wave of this epidemic, which will inevitably hit Philadelphia to some degree. Now, some governors are responding by delaying reopening or by reimposing closings. Now, here in Philadelphia, we laid out targets for what we would need to meet in order for us to reopen in the green phase. Those targets we may not meet uh, by next Friday because we're not seeing a consistent decrease in cases over four weeks, which is one of our targets, or we may not be meeting the daily case targets among the targets we may not meet. So we are not right now ready to go to the green. At the same time, we recognize the difficulties of this four-month shutdown. There's a loss in income, a loss in business, a loss in city revenue, which means the production of city services, and our children haven't been going to school. So we're trying to figure out how to balance those risks and navigate this new wave. So here's how we will respond. First, we're going to take additional steps to promote mask use by everyone in Philadelphia. We're going to remind businesses and managers of all activities that they are required to enforce mask use of their customers and their staff and people participating in their activities. We're going to be sending flyers with our safe mode guidance to businesses citywide and delivering them in person to some uh, businesses starting next week. We will be reminding residents again of the importance of wearing masks. Now, most people in Philadelphia are following our recommendations about mask use. In the middle of June, our staff did some observations. And we found that among people in SEPTA stations, 55% were wearing masks. And among people exiting retail stores, 78% were wearing masks. And that's good, uh, but it needs to be better. We need to have a higher percentage of people wearing masks. So we will be doing a media campaign promoting mask use starting in early July. And today, we will be issuing a mandatory mask order for the city of Philadelphia. That will require the use of masks at all indoor public places and outdoors if people are less than six six feet from people uh, who are from different households. There'll be limited exceptions, such as exception for children under the age of eight. Now, this order is a requirement, but we will not be enforcing this with the police. The purpose of this order is really to send a message to everyone, to enable them to encourage others to wear masks. In the end, it's up to us as Philadelphia residents to self-enforce this order. Uh, If it works, we can reduce the uh, spread of the infection. If it doesn't, we'll have more cases. It's as simple as that. Our experience shows that that written legal requirements like this can influence how people behave, even if there is no government enforcement. So we're hopeful this order will help uh, reinforce uh, the encouragement we're doing otherwise for mask use. Now, we're also recommending that people avoid social gatherings like the ones involving young people. Because of those social gatherings, people tend not to be wearing masks. And we're recommending that people in Philadelphia not travel to high incidence areas and request that people who are traveling from high incidence areas to Philadelphia self-quarantine for 14 days after they arrive here so that if they develop the infection, they don't pass it on to Philadelphia residents. We'll be listing on our website those areas we consider to be high incidence areas. Now, there are a few activities that are scheduled to restart today, and we will allow those activities to restart. That includes residential swim clubs and private pools, barbershops and beauty salons and nail salons. All of those are under safe mode guidance, where everybody needs to be reducing crowds, we need to be having a distance between them, uh, people and other people, and especially enforcing the idea that everyone needs to wear masks at these activities at all times. And we will reconsider the other green face activities that were tentatively scheduled to start next week in view of the risk. We may need to pause on restarting those activities, uh, especially those that are both indoors and where mask use is not practical, such as indoor dining and restaurants. We will be monitoring the epidemic over the weekend. We're gonna be discussing this with businesses and organizations involved. 
we'll get more information on for you on that next week. So more information and, and more detail on all the things we've discussed here today, go to our website, www.phila.gov slash COVID. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Farley. And a reminder to all of the uh, folks uh, that this is for press only. Uh, please change your login name to indicate your full name and your media affiliation. Uh, and now we will go over to Armando for the Spanish language translation of the mayor's and Dr. Farley's comments. Mensaje del alcalde Jim Kenny para el 26 de junio del 2020. Buenas tardes a todos. Hoy firmé una serie de proyectos de ley, incluidos unos relacionados con la pandemia y con nuestros esfuerzos en su contra. En particular, firmé el presupuesto del año fiscal 2021 y que es un claro recordatorio del costo que esta crisis significa para nuestras finanzas y para nuestra capacidad de brindar servicios en la ciudad. Nuevamente, le agradezco al Consejo Municipal por su apoyo durante este proceso presupuestario, que es el más difícil de todas nuestras carreras. Entre los proyectos de ley firmados hoy se encuentra la Ley de Protección de Trabajadores Esenciales, presentada por la concejal Jim, que protege a los trabajadores contra represalias por denunciar condiciones laborables que violen las órdenes de salud pública estatales o municipales. A medida que comenzamos a reabrir nuestra economía, es fundamental que los empleadores tomen todas las precauciones necesarias para mantener saludables a sus trabajadores, para así ayudar a reducir la propagación del coronavirus en Filadelfia. Los trabajadores de Filadelfia deben poder denunciar cualquier violación de las normas de salud pública sin temer represalias. Hay otro proyecto de ley firmado hoy, el proyecto de ley número 200329, que le asigna 40 millones 400 mil dólares en fondos federales de la ley CARES para que el Departamento de Planificación y Desarrollo enfrente las necesidades de vivienda y desarrollo comunitario tras la emergencia del COVID-19. A medida que continuamos recuperándonos del impacto del COVID-19 y vemos que se reanudan más servicios en la ciudad, me complace compartir que a partir del día lunes, 6 de julio, el Departamento de Calles comenzará a recolectar artículos de reciclaje cada semana junto con la basura. Las recolecciones regulares de basura y reciclaje continuarán en su horario normal o tan cerca de él como sea posible. Le recordamos a los residentes que no se recogerán materiales de reciclaje la semana del 29 de junio, ya que el calendario de recolección de cada dos semanas sigue vigente hasta el 6 de julio. Finalmente, quiero reconocer al equipo de Philly Counts por sus esfuerzos continuos para continuar creando conciencia sobre el Censo 2020, a pesar de que la pandemia global haya cambiado las condiciones de su plan original. Y ahora quisiera hablarles del Censo con más detalles. A lo largo del verano, el trabajo de Philly Counts la iniciativa de la ciudad para promover el censo del 2020 se centrará en promover la participación de los residentes a través de su plan Verano del Censo o Summer of Census en inglés, que incluye la distribución de volantes, paneles de contacto telefónico y el difundir novedades por las redes sociales, asimismo como promover la conclusión del censo en varios puntos de servicio y la realización de varios eventos digitales relacionados con el censo. Kelly Count también ha continuado trabajando con las comunidades de difícil acceso durante esta pandemia a través de los paneles de llamadas telefónicas. Todos los días, el equipo de Philly Counts y sus voluntarios llaman a miles de hogares en Filadelfia para asegurarse de que tengan lo que necesitan y para mantenerse seguros y saludables y también para crear conciencia sobre la importancia del censo. Hasta la fecha, ellos han realizado casi 140.000 llamadas a hogares en Filadelfia y le han ayudado a más de 7.000 hogares a hacer un plan para rellenar el censo. Este trabajo es esencial mientras continuamos recuperándonos de las consecuencias de la pandemia del COVID-19. El censo determinará cuántos fondos recibe Filadelfia para servicios críticos, incluyendo el socorro en casos de desastre a lo largo de la próxima década. Si usted no lo ha llenado todavía, por favor, complete el censo del año 2020. Puede hacerlo en línea yendo a my2020census.gov. Y esta es la actualización en materia de salud para el día viernes 26 de junio del 2020. Buenas tardes. Tengo varias apreciaciones sobre el curso de la epidemia en Filadelfia. La primera oleada está terminando, pero la segunda ya está comenzando. Primero, les comparto las cifras para el día de hoy. Se han reportado 143 nuevos casos, con un total de 25.693 casos acumulados. 
Hoy, felizmente, no reportamos muertes. El total acumulado a la fecha es de 1.579 fallecimientos. Estos datos nos llegan en grupos, pero esta es una señal de que los fallecimientos por la COVID-19 van disminuyendo. El brote del coronavirus en las cárceles ha terminado. No se han reportado casos ya en seis semanas. El brote del coronavirus en los hogares de ancianos también ha disminuido notablemente. Pero lamentablemente el número de casos en nuestras comunidades no ha disminuido. Desde la semana pasada el promedio es de 100 casos diarios y este número está aumentando poco a poco. Del total de pruebas realizadas, el porcentaje positivo de los casos es del 5 al 6%. Hace 10 días, menos del 5% de las pruebas resultaban positivas. Se ha evidenciado también un aumento en los casos en los adolescentes entre 16 y 19 años que han asistido a eventos sociales. En todos lados, las señales nos demuestran que la epidemia está empeorando. En los Estados Unidos, el conteo de los casos subió en más del 50% desde hace 14 días. Hay aumentos de los casos en casi todos los estados. En otros, se han alcanzado nuevos puntos máximos. En la Florida y Texas, por ejemplo, se han reportado más de 5.000 casos diarios. Los hospitales en Texas están bajo tensión máxima y esto aún pudiera empeorar. El número de casos va aumentando también en muchas regiones de Pensilvania, en Delaware y en New Jersey. Las metas que nos planteamos para pasar a la fase verde posiblemente no serán alcanzadas para el próximo viernes. No hemos visto una disminución en el número de casos en las últimas cuatro semanas. Al mismo tiempo, reconocemos las dificultades de un cierre de actividades de cuatro meses, la pérdida de ingresos para los negocios, la suspensión de las actividades escolares y por eso estamos tratando de buscar un balance adecuado. ¿Cuál será nuestra respuesta? Tomar medidas adicionales para promover el uso de máscaras, tapabocas o cobertores faciales. Recordarles a los negocios, gerentes y supervisores que deben hacer cumplir con su uso. Les estamos enviando material informativo a los negocios a lo largo de la ciudad con las directrices para reiniciar actividades en el modo seguro. La entrega de estos materiales en persona comenzará la semana que viene. Y nuevamente, le recordamos a los residentes la importancia sobre el uso de las máscaras, los tapabocas o cobertores faciales. Muchos de nuestros residentes, felizmente, siguen esta norma. En el periodo del 13 al 24 de junio, el 55% de usuarios de SEPTA las observaron y en las tiendas fue de un 78%. Esos números son buenos, pero debieran ser mejores. Vamos a desarrollar una campaña de comunicación sobre el uso de las máscaras que comenzará a principios de julio. El uso de las máscaras será ahora obligatorio y esto lo haremos vía orden ejecutiva. Las máscaras serán obligatorias en espacios públicos al aire libre y también bajo techo. Esto tendrá algunas excepciones, por ejemplo, para los niños menores de 8 años de edad. Recomendamos también evitar las reuniones sociales, en especial aquellas que involucren adolescentes. Les recomendamos a las personas en Filadelfia no viajar a zonas que tengan alto número de casos. Les recomendamos a las personas que han viajado a Filadelfia desde zonas con alto número de casos el guardar una cuarentena de 14 días tras su llegada a Filadelfia. Vamos a permitir que se reinicien algunas actividades pautadas para su reinicio el día de hoy. Las piscinas residenciales y los clubes de natación privados, por ejemplo. Los salones de belleza y las barberías. Todo esto bajo las directrices del modo seguro, sin embargo. Es imperativo hacer respetar la distancia social y reducir las multitudes. Usar máscaras es clave en este proceso y es una forma de ayudar a contener el virus. Y vamos a reconsiderar el reinicio de otras actividades en la fase verde en función del riesgo que veamos. Podríamos detener el reinicio de algunas actividades, especialmente aquellas bajo techo y en las cuales el uso de máscaras es complicado por ejemplo, el permitir el servicio completo en restaurantes. Vamos a monitorear la epidemia durante este fin de semana y vamos a conversar sobre las próximas medidas con los negocios y las organizaciones involucradas. Les vamos a proporcionar a ustedes mayor información la semana que viene. Mientras tanto, por favor, ayúdanos a frenar esta epidemia. Use una máscara al salir y mantén la distancia social, porque juntos es como debemos superar esta crisis. Gracias. 
Great. Thank you, Armando. And we are now going to move to the Q&A portion for members of the media. Submit your questions to topics related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And if time permits, we will open the floor later to other topics. If your hand is currently raised for another topic now, please lower it and we'll try to get to you later. And remember, of course, we have limited time during these briefings, so only one representative from each media outlet is permitted to ask questions, and reporters are asked to limit their questions to three or fewer. We will, as I said, move to another round of questions if time permits. So now let's start off with Mitch Blocker of NBC10. Good afternoon, uh, Commissioner. Can you can you explain a little bit how what you're seeing in Texas, Florida, and even in Delaware is affecting your decision to go slow or even even to pull back here? Dr. Farley, uh, you need to unmute. You there we go. I'm sorry. Uh, to a certain extent, this epidemic is just one epidemic across the entire country. Uh, people cross borders. Uh, any infection that's happening elsewhere is going to affect us. Uh, so, in fact, we have very high case counts in Florida and Texas. We're going to see some people coming here. They'll, they'll also infect some other people who come here. Um, and just the fact that uh, similar actions have been taken with reopening all across the area uh, are, uh, is going to cause some amount of increase in spread, as it did in Florida and Texas. Uh, so uh, as much as we would like to just say this epidemic is over, it's clearly not. Uh, there's uh, nothing we can do to stop an epidemic wave. We can uh, try to limit it, though, and that's uh, the actions we talked about, how to try to limit it. What would trigger a move back to yellow for you? Um, you know, I think we're going to take this one step at a time, right? Now, the, the first step is to say, all right, we're not seeing the data that says that we can move to green. Uh, the number of cases we're seeing per day right now is still relatively low. The number of deaths we're seeing is very low. Uh, if things get worse, then we'll reconsider additional steps. And I have one, one question for the mayor as well. Um, for business owners in, in Philadelphia, I'm just curious your thoughts about how these restrictions may push business to the, to the suburbs, which are um, obviously a little less restrictive than here in Philadelphia. I mean, we're, hopefully that's not the case. But again, um, I don't want to trump an economic decision. Or I don't want to trump a health decision with an economic decision. Because in the end, if we don't, if we don't get it right, uh, both the suburbs and us will be hurtling back to yellow at some point. And um, I think the short-term gain um, is not worth the long-term pain of having to revert back. So while I recognize there may, there may be some folks who do go to the suburbs, um, I, I mean, I understand if they want to uh, do more shopping or, or do it differently. Um, I understand that. We're try, we'll try to get ourselves where we need to be as soon as possible. But again, is there a sense in hurtling into a into a problem that's going to set us back even even further thank you gentlemen thank you mitch let's uh, now go to shari arias of telemundo um la pregunta muy buenos días hi everyone so la pregunta es armando la siguiente para que todo el mundo esté claro se va a mover hacia la fase verde el viernes o no en cuanto a la información que tenemos para el día de hoy Y si no es así, ¿qué son las cosas que se van a poder hacer a partir del viernes y cuáles son las cosas que no se van a poder hacer si en dado caso la ciudad no se mueve hacia la fase verde? Armando, you need to unmute. It's real. I apologize. We're moving on to the green phase on Friday, isn't it? If that's not the case, what will not be allowed? Um, I'm not sure I, I fully caught the question, but to just to be clear again, there are some activities that were scheduled to be open today. They will be allowed to reopen today. As far as the activities that were scheduled tentatively, if we met targets to reopen next week, we're going to reconsider those in view of the fact that it does not look like we're going to meet the targets. And we'll have more information on that next week. Eh, las actividades que se programaron para abrirse el día de hoy van a abrirse el día de hoy. Con respecto a las otras a, a, actividades que son tentativas en su apertura, va a depender de la información con que contemos y tal vez tengamos que reconsiderarlo. Ok, entonces le podrías preguntar a él cuáles son los números 
que podrían ocasionar que la apertura no suceda este viernes y cuáles son los números de casos que tendrían que ver para que la apertura sí suceda este viernes. In, in connection with the first question, what would be the figures that would prevent you from opening up as planned on Friday? And what would be the figures that would be acceptable to proceed opening up as intended on Friday? The target numbers we laid out was uh, fewer than uh, 80 cases per day or percent positive less than 4%. Uh, and right now we're greater than 100 per day and percent positive between 5 and 6%. Uh, there are other metrics as well, which we are more likely to meet, but those are the two that we are less likely to meet. Hay varias cifras que estamos considerando, pero había dos objetivos específicos que teníamos en cuenta, que era el contar con menos de 80 casos diariamente y la tasa de resultados positivos entre el 4% aproximadamente. Y lo que tenemos en estos momentos es unos 100 casos por día y una tasa de resultados positivos que van del 5 al 6%. Por supuesto que también estamos observando otras medidas para tomar esta decisión. Armando, y por último, porque se estaba cortando la, la transmisión en la computadora, para, para que los televidentes estén bien claros, ¿continuamos con que el viernes será el día para pasar a la fase verde? Eh, y en dado caso, si los números cambian en, en, unas, en unos cuantos días, eso es lo que se puede ser que, que cambie, pero... A partir del día de hoy, continuamos de que la ciudad va a pasar a la fase verde el viernes. Explícale que se estaba desconectando. There was a bit of a disconnection, so she would like this to be clear for her audience. If figures change, obviously there will be a change in plans. But up to today, with what we have, are we still on to move the transition into the green phase by Friday? Uh, given the numbers we have right now, we are not meeting our targets for reopening next Friday. In view of that, we're going to reconsider and determine what can, if anything, of that next batch reopen on Friday. And we'll talk about that next week. En estos momentos, no hemos llegado a satisfacer los objetivos numéricos que nos permitieran proceder como teníamos inicialmente programado para pasar a la fase verde el día viernes. Nosotros vamos a considerar qué medidas tomamos y vamos a informarlo en base al siguiente grupo de datos que nos llegue de aquí a esta fecha. Ok, gracias Armando. Y si él tiene algún mensaje que quiere, o el alcalde que quieren compartir con los dueños de negocios que estaban esperando a abrir sus negocios. Is there any message that either the mayor, Dr. Farley, would like to share with the business owners that were hoping to have their business open by that date? Uh, okay, doctor. The message is that we want to not have a big second wave of coronavirus infection in Philadelphia. So any reopening we want to do safely. El mensaje es que nosotros no queremos tener una segunda ola de infecciones aquí en Filadelfia. El mensaje es que queremos que se reabra, pero que se reabra dentro de medidas de seguridad. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Shira. Now we're going, going to go to Martin Pratt of YBN Philly. Thank you. Uh, this is the first okay. question for Dr. Oh. Hello. Keep going. Go okay. This, this first question is for Dr. Farley. Uh, Dr. Farley, um, based on uh, what other governors have said as far as a quarantine, if you travel from certain cities or states into their uh, state, are you also considering or recommending that? Uh, asking people who travel from high incidence areas to Philadelphia self-quarantine for 14 days after they come here. Uh, we recognize that's something that we cannot enforce and we don't know right. when people cross the border, but we are requesting that to try to uh, limit as much as possible the infection from getting in the city. Excellent. And the last question for you is uh, there was a study that was released two days ago that showed asymptomatic patients in China. They were in, uh, I think it was Shanghai uh, University. They were put into a negative G room um, and they were uh, asymptomatic, but had tested positive. And in that room, uh, even though the asymptomatic means they didn't have any obvious symptoms, but they test positive, uh, they were actually uh, transmitting SARS COVID-19 to four objects in the room, including the air filter, uh, the, the air ventilator system. My question is, based on that, if, isn't it a good idea for at least once or twice for everybody to get tested? We, we think 
expanded testing is a good thing. Uh, well, first I should say, we know that you can spread this infection without symptoms. Uh, more commonly, you, you can spread this infection before you have symptoms. The most appear to be the most infectious period is for people who become symptomatic, but it's in a period of time before they have symptoms. Uh, so uh, that's why we're requiring masks of everybody, not just masks of people who have symptoms. We think more testing is a good thing. However, just remember testing only gives you information about that point in time. Uh, and if you could be positive today, negative tomorrow or vice versa. And so to have everybody tested just once really doesn't do much for us. Uh, there are maybe certain settings where uh, screening asymptomatic people makes sense. We did screen asymptomatic people in the jail. We do that in nursing homes. But across the entire city, it would be a huge task to test everybody. And it really would not provide us that much information unless we could do it every day. And we can never do that every day. So uh, we're not recommending, you know, regular testing for people who are just have no symptoms. Uh, one last question, UV lighting. Uh, people are starting to sell these online. I'm starting to see them pop up into different people's houses. Uh, do you recommend that as a way to kill uh, COVID-19, uh, having a UV light? They're desktop models that they're being starting to sell. Or is that just, uh, you know, fool foolery? You know, in, in theory, UV light may kill the virus and it may reduce transmission. But I don't think we really have enough science behind it to know that there's a benefit. Uh, so companies will sell that. Maybe there's a benefit, maybe not. Uh, I would recommend that people put their energies on those things which we know are going to make a difference, which is masks. That's very simple and very cheap. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Martin. Let's go now to Laura McChrystal of being. Hi, um, my first question is um, regarding masks. The Archdiocese of Philadelphia announced that they would be easing mask requirements um, in light of, you know, the city issuing an order requiring masks. Um, what is your response to that? I had not heard that announcement. Uh, I would strongly recommend that they follow our recommendations and our order, and that everyone uh, wear masks in religious services. Religious services are particularly high risk. We have uh, many examples of uh, outbreaks that are occurring in religious services, including outbreaks where there are multiple deaths involved. And so I would hope the Archdiocese would take this very seriously and require everyone in those services to be wearing masks. Okay. Um, and another question for Dr. Farley. Um, to clarify, you said cases are no longer decreasing. Um, with there being 143 cases today, is it fair to say they are actually rising or are we at a plateau right now? Uh, I would say they are rising. I don't think they're rising fast, but they do appear to be increasing. Okay. Um, and, you know, you mentioned that there are no borders to the virus. Um, even with just the surrounding counties going fully into the green phase today, are you worried that, um, you know, that could cause even more increases for Philadelphia as a result? Uh, I am worried. You know, it is my job to be worried, uh, but I am worried in general uh, about reopening without people wearing masks. And so I understand uh, the, the difficulties of the shutdown. And so I understand why people want to reopen. And I think that there are things that we could reopen safely if we are really uh, vigilant about the mask use. Uh, so to the extent that they're reopening without masks, I'm very concerned about that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Let's go now to Natasha Brown of CBS3. Hi, um, this message is, I mean, this question is for Dr. Farley. Um, just in light of seeing, you know, lots of, I was out earlier today seeing, the, you know, the hair salons, barbershops, everybody reopening uh, and seeming to follow protocol, um, at least the one that I saw particularly. What about, is there some way that you're gauging whether these businesses are doing the right thing if they're, if they're following protocol and, and is there uh, some way to do that just to make sure that they're trying to contain this this virus as much as possible? Yeah, we're assessing this to the extent that we can given the staff that we have. So we are, we regularly inspect restaurants. So for example, so when we go into restaurants, we're going to be observing mask use as well as the other safety features that we're supposed to be doing. And we will be giving very direct uh, feedback to restaurants, those that have outdoor dining, those that have takeout, and don't have indoor dining now. Um, and, and there are other places that we inspect, uh, such as tattoo parlors, for example. Beyond that, we are monitoring mask use with the, uh, the statistics I presented just a little bit ago, uh, just by observing how many people are wearing masks in septic stations and as they exit stores. Uh, and we hope to see those numbers increase. 
Uh, but much of this is going takes place at places where we don't have inspectors there. And so we're really pleading with uh, business owners to take this seriously. In the end, it's going to not serve anybody well uh, if people don't follow the safety guidelines seriously. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natasha. Let's go now to Kennedy Rose of the Philadelphia Business Journal. Hi, everyone. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Carley. Uh, I know you answered earlier about possibly reverting back to yellow phase, but I was wondering, would Philadelphia consider walking back some business reopenings like outdoor dining, dining if it's seeing cases rise? Uh, you know, we do think that uh, people outdoors have a lower risk than people indoors. Uh, I did uh, discuss, uh, I think about a week or so ago, that I was concerned about some of the outdoor dining not following our standards. Uh, we'll watch that. If we have evidence of spread in outdoor dining, then I would definitely consider that. Um, or if we have evidence that there is a you know, really broad-based uh, ignoring of the safety rules, I would consider that. I hope that outdoor dining is something which is done safely and that this provides an opportunity for restaurants to maintain a business and maintain an income uh, during this tough period. All right. That's all I had. Thanks so much. Thanks, Kennedy. Let's go now to Pat Loeb of KYW Radio. Pat, you're up. Pat, I know you're uh, unmuted, but okay. Is, there can we you go. Hear? Okay. Now we can hear. Thanks, and we are on the second round, right? Yes, we okay. are now on a second round, and we can uh, open the floor to other questions. To other Thank topics. you. So I'd like to ask the mayor if he's reviewed the action plan released by the police commissioner and uh, and what his thoughts are on implementing it since um, there are calls to defund the police. I have not reviewed the action plan as of yet. Uh, when, when was it released? Yesterday or today? Today. No, I have not seen it yet. Okay. And um, it, why did you allow uh, Chief Inspector Wilson to take a voluntary demotion um, when he had sort of violated protocols? Do you th really think that was um, sufficient? For, first of all, I don't micromanage departments. That's the commissioner's. Uh, decision uh, to allow that or not allow that. And um, I have confidence in her ability to lead the department and uh, never interfere with personnel decisions. Um, and haven't done it with Commissioner Ross. Don't intend to do it with uh, Commissioner Allo. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Pat. Let's go now to Rudy Chinchilla of NBC10. Hi, everybody. Um, hope you can see me. Oh, there we are. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Farley, um, I know a couple other reporters have asked this, uh, you know, a asking about the possibility of going, uh, of still going green July 3rd, but can, can you sort of clarify that? Because it, it sort of sounds like just by definition of these new cases, we will, the, the city will not be able to enter the green phase by July 3rd, because I, I think what you had said, uh, last week was we needed to see, um, I think it was four weeks of 80, averaging 80 new cases a day or fewer if we've already exceeded the threshold is there even a, the remote possibility that we are we're still going to enter the green phase by july 3rd yeah I, the the targets does not say we need to be less than 80 for four weeks it was to get to 80 uh, cases per day uh, i would say it's very unlikely we're going to hit that target next week and that's the message today as to how we respond to that that's something that as i said we're going to look at and discuss with the industries involved and tell you more with that next week how much coordination are you having with uh, surrounding counties? Because I would imagine this affects all, you know, all the counties around Philadelphia. Uh, we're in routine communication with the counties around us. Uh, these are difficult decisions and each county is somewhat different. Uh, and so we're not going to always make the same decisions, but we, uh, we definitely are talking to them regularly. Thank you. Um, I do have one more question. It's not coronavirus related. Um, Mayor Kenny, um, so, you know, given the, the fallout that we've seen, uh, you know, regarding the use of pepper spray on protesters and, and how the, just the protests in general played out, um, and given that Commissioner Outlaw did have some issues with crowd control when, when she was back in Portland, do you wish maybe, you know, city leadership um, might have provided more support or do you think they could have provided more support at the beginning phases of these protests, especially given the fact that, you know, she's, she's new in the city? Um, first of all, you have to, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, and it's easy to armchair all of this um, from a safe, safe spot on a Monday morning. 
Um, but this information was coming at us in real time. Uh, we were in the emergency command center. Uh, we were seeing aerial uh, views of, of the various scenes. Uh, and um, decisions were made based on what information was being provided to us at the time. That information turned out to be incorrect or misleading. Uh, and that's why the apology came yesterday, uh, because we were we didn't have the correct information. Uh, but I think she received all the appropriate support um, um, from from the folks around her um, and the people in the OEC and on the street. Uh, this was an unprecedented uh, situation. I don't remember. I'm, I'll be 62 next month uh, in August, and I don't remember anything like this in my lifetime. So um, there were good things done. There were things that were done correctly, and there were mistakes made. And that's why we review that and make sure that it doesn't happen again. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Rudy. Let's go now to our Henny's Figueroa of Univision. Hello, good afternoon. Escuchan? You hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, okay, good. Cool. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I will need translation. Uh, Armando, estás allí? Buenas tardes, Argenis. Gracias. Buenas tardes, Armando. Muchísimas gracias. Armando, eh, mi pregunta es para el alcalde Kenny. Um, hace unos días el presidente Trump uh, firmó una orden ejecutiva que paraliza la inmigración legal a través de visas de trabajo. Ya el gobernador Wolf uh, se pronunció al respecto y nos gustaría tener unas palabras del alcalde Kenny sobre este tema. Gracias. This question is for Mayor Kenny. We know now that uh, President Trump has signed an executive order suspending work visas. And uh, we have heard from Governor Wolf in this regard. What would be your message about it? I mean, everything Donald Trump does on most things are wrong, uh, especially when it comes to immigration and immigration issues. Um, he is totally wrong. Uh, and uh, the, that what I would say is that make sure you vote in November and get rid of them. Um, and we'll get back to some sense of normalcy. Todo lo que dice el presidente Trump y la mayoría de cosas que él hace están equivocadas, especialmente en el tema de la inmigración. Él está totalmente equivocado. El mensaje para todos es que se registren y que voten en noviembre para poder rectificar las cosas. Ok, muchísimas gracias, Armando. Es todo. Por nada, Argenis. Thank you, Mayor. Argenis, did you have more? Are you good? No, no, no. I'm, I'm fine. Thank you. It's just that. All right. Very Thank good. So Thank you. Let's go now to Matt Petrillo of CBS3. Okay, there we go. Hey, good afternoon. Thanks for your time. Um, ju re just regarding yesterday's news conference, um, regarding the apology to the I-76 protesters, uh, do, do you believe one is owed at all for the tear gas use in West Philadelphia um, re regarding the community there? Um, we're told there was a family who had to leave their house and other people watching nearby who were tear gassed. There were, were incidents going on in West Philadelphia that were heightened um, danger. Um, there was arson that was going on. There were police cars being set on fire and bolted uh, and, and directed at police. Uh, there were uh, all kinds of things that were going on that were, that were, of, da were of a danger. Uh, and to let that continue to escalate would have put people, I think, uh, in the protesters and the police in uh, in more in harm's way uh, and the ability to dispense or to dispel that crowd to get control of the area uh, they believed the police believed at the time was necessary and anyone you just anyone that was uh, inconvenienced or affected by that I do I do apologize to them but the situation uh, there was a uh, tenuous and dangerous and uh, needed to be uh, rectified yeah I do want to you know we've we've heard some similar reports uh, about uh, what what some would um, are calling inappropriate use of, of force. And all of those reports are going to be investigated as well, um, partly as a, as part of the after action report, but also uh, individual uh, individual cases are going to be investigated. So um, we're certainly not taking those lightly. And if if there are mistakes made, we're certainly going to address those mistakes. Thank you. That's all I had. All right. Thank you, Matt. Let's back now to Rudy Chinchilla of NBC Ten. Hi again. Uh, so uh, the first uh, question is regarding uh, the possible second wave, as um, Dr. Farley, you said, we were starting to see um, signs that that could be a possibility. Uh, so so the, the question is actually, how does it, given the fact, uh, Mayor Kenny, that you, you, know, you said you signed the new budget re, um, just earlier today, 
Um, how much of that new budget considers this possibility of a second wave? And um, do you have any fears that it can, you know, a second wave could wreak more havoc than has already been wreaked on uh, the city budget? Yeah, well, we do have those fears, and that's why we're telling everybody to put a mask on and act responsibly. Uh, and if it does have an impact on our budget, we'll have to adjust it because we can't have unbalanced budgets. So um, we'll we'll see what happens as time goes on, and we'll make adjustments based on what's presented to us. But I can't speculate on what's going to going going to or not going to happen uh, between now and the fall or the end of the year. And this next question is also somewhat budget related, but also related to the protests. Um, we know that there's already at least one. Hey, Rudy, I'm the, Rudy, I just want to interrupt you for a second. Mayor, we have lost your camera. I don't know if you accidentally turned that off. There we go. Very good. Go ahead, Rudy. So we know that there's already at least one lawsuit um, against the city. Someone is filing a lawsuit against the city, given how, you know, how the police responded during the protest, during the I-676 um, incident. Um, now that the city and the police department are admitting errors uh, in executing the plan on 676, are you worried about more lawsuits um, coming? There'll, there'll be lawsuits, more lawsuits than you could ever imagine. I suspect that we're going to be sued on a number of different different things and different reasons and uh, can't speculate on what it's going to be or how many is going to be. Uh, and even, even if they filed them, I couldn't speculate or talk to you about them because it's litigation. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Thank you, Rudy. And uh, this is the last call for questions. Seeing none further, thank you for joining us. That concludes today's daily briefing. We will resume. Our next briefing will be next Tuesday. Until then, thank you for joining us.